Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the Skubana e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. Skubana is a software platform to manage your entire e-commerce operation. Today, we have Kenny Kane. He's been coding since the age of 13. He began his career as a pharmacy tech at age 15. And Kenny is COO and co-founder of Stupid Cancer. And he oversees e-commerce, content creation, and much more. He's helped develop corporate relationships such as Siemens, General Motors, Seattle Genetics, and many more. Kenny, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. We have so many, so much good stuff to talk about, from like CancerCon to Instapeer to your to your road trip, and also running the e-commerce and going from the demand of, out of nothing. And I always like to start with a quick win uh, for people in e-commerce and what things they should be doing or shouldn't be doing. What is a must for sellers to boost sales? What what's worked with your site? Yeah, so I think. Even still, engagement probably wins above everything else. Mm. Um, you know, it's it's one thing to sell something like vacuum cleaners and hope that people just show up. Uh, it's another thing to make vacuum cleaners fun and you know do something on social media with them. Right. So, what do you do that works with engagement? Um, for stupid cancer, we have had a lot of success with posting um, people who are, are at various stages of treatment yeah. in stupid cancer wear. Um, mm. you know, a lot of our community rocks you know, the, the bald head look and they look great doing it. Mm-hmm. And those kind of posts just get so much engagement because mm. people want to um, you know, they, they want to help the person in the picture by giving them props online. Mm-hmm. So we see that those pictures will typically uh, go pretty viral. Mm-hmm. So what's been the most memorable story that you saw posted from Stupid Cancer or that you posted? Sure. So I actually was telling somebody about this recently. Um, I had a good friend named Lauren Scott who ultimately passed away at the age mm. of uh, 16 uh, from sarcoma. Oh, she was sorry to hear girl. that. Jeez. Yeah. She, she was a beautiful girl. She was um, one of the, I would say one of the most active people in our community. People just rallied around her, rallied around her mom. Um, you know, she would she she would put on like the Kurt Cobain glasses and different pictures. She had probably had you know hundreds of sunglasses, and she just made it rock. She made mm-hmm. it look great. And um, I would send her new items to Instagram and take selfies with, and we would reshare those pictures, and people would just love them because um, she was just so adorable. So you know, for me, that was probably uh, you know one of the one of the best moments. Yeah. And, you know, I have to acknowledge, I mean, I don't know how you don't get, I don't know if depressed is the right word, but that's, I mean, you day in, day out are dealing with such, um, they're uplifting stories, but they're sad in the same yeah. respect, you know, yeah. like, like that, you know, and um, from the people who don't have a sexy business, you know, like vacuum cleaners or cell phone cases or something, it, it yeah. sounds like you reached out to a raving fan and gave them stuff for them to promote to their audience or their, you know, Instagram or wherever online. If people are thinking, yeah. well, I don't have, uh, you know, that great of a story, right? One of my favorite case studies of a brand activating the community that they didn't know were using their products, mm-hmm. um, it was from a book called Brains on Fire. Hmm. And it's Fiskars, uh, the scissors with the orange handle. We've had them. Every, everybody's <laughs> yeah. had a pair of those sure. at some point. Um, so what Fiskars did is they created a group of women who were crafters, hmm. and they named them the Fisketeers. And they made it this self-electing, self-governing body where these women would travel around the country, going to trade shows and all these different things. And uh, it was... I forget how long the term was, but they would only be a fisketeer for so long, and then the next batch would be voted in or so, mm. something like that. Interesting. Um, but, you know, you talk about something from from nothing, you know, that was a really interesting story. Yeah. I mean, engagement, obviously, you do an amazing job creating community, too. What, what things have worked with creating community? Yeah, so when I came on board uh, as employee number two way back in the day, we had a really 
small footprint on Facebook. I think we had a couple of thousand. And then fast forward about a year, year and a half, um, we had about 15,000 likes. Um, people, that was kind of around the time when they converted fan pages to like pages. Mm -hmm. And um, we had a group at University of Texas, Austin, that came up with the tagline, um, like us to give cancer the bird. So one of our one of our slogans is give cancer the bird. People can get behind it. It just makes sense. It clicks. Mm -hmm. It's you know, j just edgy enough for, for the whole family. And uh, we put some money into it over the past uh, three years or so, um, probably about 15000 which in the grand scheme of things isn't a lot of money um, year over year. And we went from 15,000 likes to uh, 303,000 likes. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, yeah, and that was a mix of paid and organic. Um, you know, the paid definitely helped. As you helped start to get traction with the paid, the organic right. kicks in. So the, the, paid, the paid helped get the traction. You know, people were sharing, the organics came. Um, but without that advertisement, I don't know where we would be. We'd probably be still doing pretty well, but it was there when we needed it and it just worked. Yeah, that's really interesting. What do you, if someone asks you, Kenny, so now I have these, these likes, how do you get them onto your, your website to convert to sales? Because obviously yeah. you have an amazing cause. You don't want to leave anything on the table because this all goes to, which we'll talk about the mission of Stupid Cancer and how it came about. But how, um, how do you drive those people to your website? Yeah, so I mean, I'm still a big believer in email. Um, I, I think a lot of companies come along and they focus solely on you know, the Instagram or Facebook or Twitter. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm still a big fan of the inbox. Um, one of the things that I used to do, I pretty much do it every Friday, uh, we do a giveaway. Hmm. So I'd create a simple Google form with name, cell phone number, address, email address, uh, and you know we would let people know that we were going to pick three lucky winners. And there was a you know there was a thing at the bottom of the form that said by clicking submit you are opting into our mailing list. You know you're ours forever. We promise not to spam you. <laughs> right. Um, and you know we we were true to our word. We would we would go to like a you know number randomizer, pick three winners and send them out their product mm. or whatever it was. And then they'd come back and comment on the post. Hey, I got my T-shirt. I got my mug. Mm -hmm. But it was a great way to get those anonymous Facebook likes onto our mailing list, mm -hmm. uh, which then became, you know, lifetime customers. Yeah. That's great. I love that. Um, yeah. contests. Yeah. So what about things to avoid? What mistakes do you find that you've made or you've seen other people make? Yeah. Uh, so to that, once you have a bunch of people, it's, it's really enticing to start hitting them up repeatedly. Um, uh, so perhaps velocity of messaging and mm -hmm. and relevance because just since you you know just because you got their email address doesn't mean they necessarily want to hear from you. Right. Uh, but why the wouldn't they want to hear from you? Come on. Right. You know they're they're drinking out of their stupid cancer coffee mug that they won <laughs> and they don't want to read my email. Um, <laughs> it, we we recently migrated from Mailchimp to Bronto and part of that hmm. was part of that was the need to segment a little more intelligently. Stupid cancer overall is a lot of things to a lot of different people. Right. Um, for some people, we're just a wristband. For some people, we come off as an apparel company, uh, which then luckily when they dig a little deeper, uh, they see where the money is actually going. Right. Um, you know, obviously we're the charity, we're the conference, we're a road trip, we're a mobile app. There are so many different verticals within the organization yeah. that um, with MailChimp, we had 10 different lists. So we would have all these people in different places. You know, they would opt out of one list, still be on the other list, say, why am I getting this email? So the move to Bronto was really the first time that we had people as a contact where they could self-select what they were interested in. Mm. So giving, giving people the ability to self-select your marketing is critical. So talk about that for a second, because I think you know, the, some of the savviest marketers I know are constantly thinking and talking about segmentation. Yeah. So what does that self-selecting process look like, and how did you implement it? Yeah. So one of the biggest things was the preference page. It was actually what I did first when we migrated, 
and we've been um, segmenting on Mailchimp as well. We do a lot of local events at you know like a bar or a restaurant. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're in New York, you don't want to hear about an event happening in California. Right. So we would do you know we would do like a hundred mile radius mm -hmm. email blast. Mm. Um, so things like that worked really well for us. Yeah. Um, but the the move to Bronto um, or really any I'll call it enterprise level email platform, letting people tick the box on what they want to hear is is great. It's it's a nice offering. Yeah. Um, then you have to stick to that. You know, you, you need to only email that group. You know, it's really if easy it's to relevant. say. Yeah. Right. It's really easy to say that we want to send everyone the 25% off coupon code this weekend, but if they didn't want to hear about store coupons, yeah. you probably don't want to email them. They're going to yeah. unsubscribe and then if they were a conference attendee, they're not going to come to the conference. Yeah. You know, I did notice that. I didn't, it didn't register in my mind about segmentation, but I did notice on your site that you have these circles. Yeah. So tell me about those, the different categories that you have there. Yeah. So Matthew Zachary, our CEO and founder, uh, he is the marketing champ uh, visually for us. Okay. And, the circles really convey uh, what we like to call uh, the productized nature of the organization. So as I mentioned, we have the conference, we have uh, InstaPR, our mobile app, we have the radio show. Um, so we, you know, we, we allow people to check out our products. Um, we also have the bubbles. Are you talking about the bubbles? Yeah, like I noticed how can we help you? Yep. And then that I didn't realize, but that's the segmentation. Is I need money, I need a lawyer, I can't work, I need respite, am I fertile? And that's more like the information probably segmentation. Right, right. It's it's almost self-driven support. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, a lot of nonprofits will make their websites based on role. So for us, it would be I'm a survivor, I'm a caregiver, I'm a healthcare provider. Mm -hmm. uh, the next level down would be I'm newly diagnosed, I'm in treatment, I'm post-treatment, right. I'm in and out of treatment, I'm a long-term survivor, I'm a long-term pediatric survivor. So we do have a lot of different roles within the organization. Right. And over the years, we've tried to really figure out who they are and what you know different needs they have yeah. from content from the conference, uh, content on the radio show. And Instapeer, the mobile app, is really the first time that you know it's fully democratized where if you are say 25 with testicular cancer you're going to go in there and you're going to meet other 25 year olds with testicular cancer so you're cutting right through everything and getting to ultimately what you need yeah that looked amazing and so how does that coincide with other organizations like immerman angels we were talking about early and johnny yeah. immerman um because i know they do some some peer-to-peer -peer things also yeah yeah i mean there's really no replacement for what Johnny does. Uh, he is matching people up at a custom tailored level. Uh, you know, ours is is very much um, it's instant, it's anonymous, and uh, you know, like any other mobile app that you're connecting with, you're going to have the great connections, and then you might have the connections that you pass over. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm sure that happens with his organization as well, um, but. His is really a white glove service where ours is um, here now. Figure it out. Uh, if it's you know, it's like Uber. You get out of an Uber if you're not happy. You can rate it a one star transaction. Right. Ours is very transactional, mm -hmm. where his is a little bit more um, offline, personal, customized, cultivated, yeah. customized. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, I like your talk about segmentation and relevancy because oftentimes I think that we don't do that enough and you really have identified the different audiences so you can kind of deliver what they're wanting. What else do people, what mistakes do people make with anything with the actual store, e-commerce store itself? Yeah. I mean, so we have created you know, a, a line of products out of thin air. Um, yeah. You know, we have the intellectual property for the phrase stupid cancer, so nobody, literally no one else could do what we're doing legally. Um, I, I think some of the issues that we've had is perhaps growing a little too quickly with mm -hmm. our product offerings. Um, and what I mean by that is 
I did a shirt that says, I am a survivor. Uh, because in our community, people scream it from the mountaintop. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think maybe a misstep there was the fact that I did it in six different colors and five different sizes of each color. So now we had, you know, times X times X shirts. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a matter of when is it going to move. Um, you know, last summer we, we what, one of the issues we faced too, I'm sitting in the room, uh, we had all of our apparel in a tiny little radio studio. And now we have a third party fulfillment company. Mm -hmm. um, so we have less of the walls are closing in, but it's more about, you know, what's just sitting around in Pennsylvania. Right. On the shelf. Right. Yeah. And we'll, we'll talk about some of the systems because those are things like that allow you to actually get out and do these road trips. You're not sure. managing inventory and trying to do everything in between. Um, so I always like to include a fun fact, Kenny. Two fun facts about you. One that most people wouldn't expect, at least I didn't picture this, um, that you ride a motorcycle. And I, I did notice on your site, think, thought, uh, why do they have a t-shirt with a motorcycle and, and stupid cancer? It seemed random to me, but but uh, I'm I'm very selfish. So tell me about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I got the motorcycle when I was 21. Um, my dad, who is the cancer survivor, and if I will get into that as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, dad and I would always go look at motorcycles over the summer, and uh, I got the bike. He didn't get the bike. It's all right, dad. Since you're probably watching this, I forgive you. Um, although. This summer, I put the bike in a garage in Brooklyn. My dad's out on Long Island, and he let me know that mowing the lawn wasn't quite the same because he couldn't wrap it up with a ride around the block on the motorcycle. Mm, nice. So then so, what made you decide to create that T-shirt then? Or did you decide yeah. that? Um, so I, I've always been a big fan of Sons of Anarchy. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm definitely not your typical biker. Uh, I used to go up to Starbucks down the block on my motorcycle, and it was, <laughs> me, and it was a bunch of lawyers and doctors and guys that would play Harley dress up on Sundays trying to look badass and uh, you know the, the Sons of Anarchy movement and uh, if it is a movement I don't know if it's a movement um, just that whole line of apparel is so cool mm -hmm. um, and in char in the charity space there are a lot of charitable motorcycle riders yeah. and that's always been a pipe dream of mine to grow out uh, some of our Motorcycle runs, mm -hmm. rallies, local events. Um, so it was kind of a multi-pronged approach. Yeah, yeah. And it was definitely the path of least resistance to solicit a design for you know a motorcycle emblem, and then print it up on some T-shirts. Yeah. And actually, we had a lot of my my pipe dream happen where we had a lot of bikers comment, "Hey, I want to start a chapter in my neighborhood." Mm, nice, nice. Uh, so when you do something like that, you have to be prepared for, you know, the, the the demand from the crowd. Yeah. So would you say it was a good decision to selfishly create the T-shirt, or <laughs> it was? Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think I'm a New Yorker. You're in Chicago. Um, you know, certainly LA is another big city. Uh, we we forget that there are cross sections of the country in between these huge cities. Yeah. Where just because we're walk I'm walking around the streets of Manhattan, you know, most of the country are riding their motorcycles. Right. So. Yeah. And then, so the other fun fact, which I'm surprised you wanted to share this, but we'll share it anyways. Um, 1.0 at. Sorry? 1.0. What, what's 1.0 that you uh, wanted to talk about? You said, um, I got a 1.0. Oh, right. <laughs> Sorry. It's been that kind of day. Uh, yeah, so I, I you know, I, I don't know what my perception of college was, really. Um, I, I think I graduated high school in the 80s, uh, so like a B. And I was always just so curious about tech that everything else kind of fell to the wayside. Mm -hmm. And back in like, you know, the early 2000s, late 90s, we had a bit of, you know, we had a bit of tech coming into the classrooms, but a lot of it was me at home, after school, weekends, you know, my mom would yell at me to go play in the yard, and uh, I would say, no, I'm building a website on BraveNet, or GeoCities, or whatever it was. Right. And, uh, so, so my, 
you know, fast forward to time to graduate, I didn't really put a lot of thought or effort into considering where I wanted to go. Mm -hmm. uh, so ultimately, I went to uh, Suffolk Community College out on Long Island, which is you know, actually a great school. Um, people tend to call it the 13th grade. But when I went to visit my sister, who was up at Binghamton at the end of my first year, she was graduating. And graduation weekend, I saw how much fun she'd had. You know, everybody was so sad to leave. And it was a new town, a new city. And I was like, I could go here. Yeah, I could definitely go here. So I applied. I got in. Actually, I applied to school of management. And I called. So I was like a late application that summer. And I called and I said, hey, I'm checking out my application for school management. I said, please hold. Come back in line. You know, I'm sorry, Mr. Kane. I'm, I'm afraid I have to tell you you didn't get into school management. I had a 3.0 at the end of my first year. And uh, I said, well, how about the liberal arts school? So the girl was kind of puzzled on the phone, puts me on hold. I guess went to go talk to someone in the admissions office and comes back on the phone. Mr. Kane, congratulations. You've been accepted to Binghamton University. <laughs> so I, I went up. I think orientation was two days before school. And uh, I remember we had, like, day one was picking out classes. And then day two, we were going to sit down at the computer, which was a super old, really crappy registration software. And we're, I had decided to uh, repeat a couple of classes that I had taken that I didn't quite get. Uh, the grade I wanted, so maybe a C, or I think I had a D in microeconomics. So I was like, "Yeah, I'll take I'll take micro again." Um, and 45 minutes into this hour-long registration process, the server goes down, so everyone loses their schedule. Comes back up about five minutes later, so now we have 10 minutes to register, and all the classes I had picked out were gone. Mm. Um, so I, you know, I was a sophomore at the time, so they were really upper level classes, like 400 level globalization classes. So was so the 1.0 referring to your GPA or what was it? Yes. Oh, yeah. okay. So this is, that's the end of the story. So I picked out all these classes and I think I had, I had 15 credits that went down to, I think nine and I got straight A's in Spanish. Um, but it was at 8am. My roommates, I was tripled in a double. The roommates wouldn't go to bed. Uh, so I couldn't wake up for the class. Everything that could have worked against me worked against me for this semester at Binghamton. And I left with a 1.0. Uh, I went back to Suffolk for a year. Mm. And then finally I stumbled upon the program that I graduated with at Farmingdale. But, yeah, so That's I'm going to write. That's a painful, painful yeah, thing. It was a, it was a good you self it was a good self realization, though. Because, you know, I, I had always wondered, like, all right, if I go away to school, what would it be like? And I knew mm. that it, almost at day one that I, it was going to be a nightmare. So talk to me. Kenny, about the mission of Stupid Cancer. We've mentioned, you know, Matthew at the beginning of the interview, Matthew Zachary. Um, how did it get started originally? Yeah. So Matt was diagnosed in 95 with a brain tumor, uh, medial blastoma. He was also at Binghamton, uh, which was one of our early, uh, I guess, points of aha. Uh, he was classically trained as a piano player and he went to the health services on campus because he started getting headaches and his left hand started uh, getting numb. So as a piano player, mm -hmm. pianist, he, right. he knows when your, your, your hand stops working. And nobody was taking him serious that he needed to get further, you know, second opinions and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, thought he had, you know, all sorts of different stuff from meningitis to Epstein-Barr. And finally he got an MRI and they discovered they had a uh, medulla blastoma brain tumor. And uh, he went for surgery, radiation, uh, had to reteach himself how to play, and you know, walked away from the experience like, what the heck just happened to me? So 10 years later, uh, there was a document that came out called Closing the Gap. And it showed that people 0 to 15 and, 15, uh, and 40 plus were surviving cancer much more frequently but this middle section of 15 to 39 year olds mm. were dying more frequently. Wow. Uh, didn't have didn't have good outcomes, yeah. uh, or as good outcomes as the other populations. So that really led the charge with Matt, um, deciding that he was going to focus on this age group. Uh, early on, I would tell people that we were like Facebook for cancer, where you can only be you know, a certain age. 
to, to benefit from us. Yeah, because eventually, you know, I want to talk about your journey when you, once you get to, to stupid cancer. Um, yep. But you were personally affected, and that's one of the reasons you are so passionate about it. Yeah. Uh, so 10 years ago, when I was indecisive about college in May of 2005, uh, my dad came to me one day and said, hey, listen, I have something to tell you. And I said, what's up? And he was getting something out of the fridge and you know, had dropped it and kind of hit himself in, uh, in the crotch and noticed that it wasn't getting better. It, it was hurt, uh, hurting days later. And luckily, he had access to some urologists that he worked with at a hospital. And they said, yeah, you know, this is something's here. So maybe uh, two or three days later, he was on the operating table, uh, had an orchiectomy. Oh. And then that summer, uh, went f through chemo. And I actually had to pick him up from his first chemo to come to high school graduation. Um, so here I am, you know, cap and gown, best time of my life, you know, had prom the night before. You know, life was great. We're getting out of here. And, you know, I have to look out to the crowd and see my dad, you know, looking exhausted. Hmm. And it was just, you know, it was, I feel like Kurt Vonnegut would have had something to say about it, you know, fr from a irony perspective. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that too, I didn't really know what the future held for him. I didn't know what the future held for me. Yeah. I was planning for college and, and, you know, continuing with my life. And I didn't know to the, the degree of care that he would need. Um, so we, we kind of went through it together. I was his healthcare proxy. I took him to surgeries. I picked him up from surgery. And, uh, you know, it's definitely impactful. And I had been in the pharmacy field for a couple of years at that point. So I had, I had a basic understanding and appreciation for the significance of the event. But you're never really prepared when something like that happens right. to you. What was the toughest part for you in, in that, that time period, seeing your death? Yeah, I, I think for me and for all caregivers... Uh, you're always wishing that the roles could be reversed. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody wants to see a loved one go through something so traumatic and, you know, at times dehumanizing. And, um, you know, there are definitely times when I wish we just weren't there at all. Right. But, you know, if you're going to go through it, you might as well, you know, go through it with someone. Yeah. And, Okay, I know that you start off, you did your internship there, which was like 90 hours. It grew to like 900 hours or something like yeah. that. And then you brought, you were the second employee um, that came on. And we were talking before about the co-founder that they kind of, they were um, one company. What were they called? I'm Too Young. Yeah, so that Matt, when Matt started the organization way back when, it was called Steps for a Living. Mm -hmm. And his... Uh, his goal, the mission was to provide music therapy for people diagnosed with cancer. Mm. Um, so we had this great community of creatives who were impacted by cancer. Uh, and then, you know, the report came out in 06 that helped him kind of define who was going to be part of this. And uh, the name changed in 07 to I'm Too Young for This Cancer Foundation. Um, also known as I2Y Cancer Foundation. Mm -hmm. So there was kind of two brands working together. Uh, and it was a great name. It, it worked. I mean, it hooked me. It conveyed the sentiment. You know, a lot of doctors and healthcare providers will tell people, or, you know, just the general, you know, feel for it is you're too young for cancer. Right. You're in your right. 20s and 30s. Um, but stupid cancer really, it, it, it kind of made its way to the top. Um, People started calling Matt and I the guys from Stupid Cancer. Um, you know, people mm -hmm. would call us. Stupid, people would call us Stupid Cancer. We would have to correct them. No, where I'm too young for this. It was just a lot of it just stuck. It was a lot of effort to fight the whole Stupid Cancer change. So one day right. we were just like, "All right, that's it." Yeah, and so what were some of the some of the traction that you saw early on when you started implementing the e-commerce? Because I know when we were talking. There, you create a demand out of nothing. What were some? What did it look like early on? Right. So the during the I two I I'm too young for this period. We did have a, a pretty elementary T shirt offering on Cafe Press. Um, Matt had done, you know, like this stupid cancer kind of block on a shirt, and then it had like the word testicular with an arrow, 
so like stupid testicular cancer mm. uh and that was across the board for all cancers and it, it worked it was great uh i think we would probably get about 400 dollars a month from that which probably equated to selling two to three hundred t-shirts if we were making a dollar or two off them mm -hmm. uh, which is the inherent problem with trying to scale on a website like cafe press it's great for one-offs and for personalization but it's not necessarily going to you know, help your margin. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, what was next after that? Yeah. So we, <clears throat> we, and at the same time, we were selling our wristbands through a third party uh, called Loser Kids, which is like a pop punk apparel website. And at the time, one of our board members had a Volusion store, and I remember, you know, throwing the idea around, uh, like, what if we just created our own store and brought it in house? And at the time, out, you know, it was like, who's going to run it? And I said, well. You know, I have, I have ten minutes here in this part of my day. I'll I'll do it then. And uh, prior to the store launch, I think we would do about five thousand dollars a year in revenue. And our first year on Volusion, which was nine months out of the year, we did twenty five thousand. Nice. So immediately there, and back then, you know, like I said, we were probably hovering around twenty five, thirty thousand Facebook likes. So we were still pretty small. Yeah. Um, so I, I think we all took a step back and said, all right, there's something here. And then the next year we did about uh, 68000 and then we just closed out the last year at 117000 Congrats. Uh, that's great. Yeah. So we're, we're doubling year over year. And, uh, you know, kind of as, as much as we've grown with Facebook, we've grown in revenue and store size. Yeah. So what are the best sellers? What have you found the best sellers uh and in contrast, what did you think were to be best sellers that did not sell well? Yeah. So the average cart size is about $40, uh, which could be a hoodie or it could be two T-shirts or a T-shirt and a 10-pack of wristbands. Mm -hmm. That's that's usually the configuration. Um, definitely sell a lot of hoodies. Uh, I'm lucky to have a woman named Stephanie that helps me do all my apparel. She is a, uh, a Kayser and Blair rep out of Florida, and she might as well be a part to full-time employee at times because she helps me manage supply chain and and all that good stuff and I you know I, I we wouldn't be where we are without her um, yeah. but her and I have fun because she is always going to trade shows and always letting me know like hey you know we have this new product you know maybe it's a a beer koozie with a hoodie on it you know like these little chachi things so we we do test with a bit of that kind of stuff mm -hmm. we did a pill box um, the pill box was a hit, but then it was discovered that after you know a couple of months of use, that the the, the tops would open on the on the different days. Um, so you know we we've kind of gone through the ringer with testing some of the mm -hmm. knickknacks. Um, definitely the t-shirts are our bread and butter. Mm -hmm. We we started on a Gildan 5000, and we've since uh, started printing on like a Taltex 0202 which is a more American apparel-like T-shirt. Mm. So people are buying these shirts, they're wearing the shirts, you know, people are getting them as gifts, and yeah, it's not something you just throw on the shelf because um, yeah. it's so comfortable. Yeah, and I noticed like there's a skateboard deck that you saw, what is that? Yeah, uh, <laughs> so I guess in a similar way that I did the motorcycle stuff, uh, we wanted to take a step towards active wear and active lifestyle yeah. and we did skateboard we did yoga pants uh, the thing about skateboards is you don't want to set them up pre-configured because everybody does their own thing with yeah. wheels trucks um, so we're just selling the, the wood plank with okay. uh, doesn't even have grip tape on it but you know, we, we've done a couple of them we did actually we did a crowdfunding campaign for instapeer the mobile app and that was one of the prizes. Hmm. So it started off as an exclusive item, which, you know, it's kind of a novelty item. It seems item. inexpensive. Is that an actual wood piece of material? Yeah. It's yeah. only $30? Yeah. So the, the board typically, I think it's around $16 cost. Wow. Um, I would expect a, it to be way more expensive, honestly. Yeah. When you start to get into the wheels and the trucks, yeah. then you're looking at close to $100 yeah. cost. So have you played around with pricing at all? I'm curious about, like in general, what's worked, what hasn't worked, or what you found to be kind of a sweet spot for certain products. Yeah. Um, I think on where to start with that. So the skateboard, for example, is $30 now. We started at 50 
you know, we probably moved a couple of units based on the excitement of a new item. Mm -hmm. And then it plateaued. Um, for me, especially before we had the warehouse, we needed to get things in and out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if Matt or even I, you know, if we saw something lingering, you know, it'd be like, all right, let's just, you know, slash the prices and, and get it out, fire sale. Mm -hmm. um, we did a we did a seven dollar t shirt sale last summer on a Gildan five thousand, which I still keep one in in the store at the ten dollar price point. So they probably cost around three fifty and you know, we make you know, the warehouse might get two out of that and then we make five dollars on it. Mm -hmm. um, but we did we put them at seven last year and, and kind of broke even or a little bit less than break even. We made money on on two two or three shirts. But we moved like twelve thousand dollars worth of inventory over a weekend, and we had a celebrity help us mm. um, promote that, and it was just a win. You know, we got all these new people walking around with our shirt on. Uh, going back to the email list, you know, we had all these new customers, so it was it was worth it was worth breaking even for. Yeah. And one thing I notice about you, Kenny, and about Stupid Cancer is you're really good at getting the word out. Um, PR, celebrity, what's your method like, when you reach out to a celebrity like that? Yeah, so w this one in particular, Italia Ricci, she is the star of ABC Family's Chasing Life. Mm. And Chasing Life is a show that focuses on someone in their uh, late 20s who uh, is going through it, you know, the, the beginning of the show, I mm -hmm. think they're on season three. Beginning of the show, she finds out she has it, and then the subsequent seasons, she is going through treatment and navigating life as someone in their 20s. I mean, it's hard enough being in your 20s and 30s. You, know, we, you throw cancer on it, and you know, this show really depicts what happens. Mm -hmm. And the, the goal of the show, which I give them a lot of respect for, was to maintain authenticity, because a lot of these movies or you know, other cancer-ish kind of stuff, they always go right for the, the stuff that just guts you. Um, you know the worst case scenarios, right. and not the common thing, but just, right. And you like know. you know the, the the cases where there's very little hope, and then you know they they pull through, or sometimes they don't pull through. And chasing life from the beginning, I remember getting an email from I guess it was the art director saying, "Hey, we're filming a show for ABC Family. Can we put up some stupid cancer signage?" Uh, they wanted to do a meetup, mm. which is one of our uh, one of our programs. So basically, they they asked for our logo. They put up a banner on the wall, and it's been in the show quite frequently. And the response was great. I That's mean, our, awesome. Yeah, our our community just got, yeah, you know, they they were they were really thrilled to see that um, from such a mainstream co mainstream company. And after that, they started wearing the shirts. They started Instagramming the shirts. The celebrities did, as well as the show properties, and. Uh, yeah, it's just been it, that kind of stuff doesn't always happen, um, right? Exactly. Especially, especially for little organizations. Yeah, but you um, do things that create that, like the road trip, right? right? So, what made you decide to do the road trip, or tell you know what is the road trip? Yeah. So in in 2011, uh, we had the final New York City OMG Summit. The OMG Summit started in 2008. And it was in partnership with another organization, so we didn't call it the Stupid Cancer Conference. Um, and the OMG Summit, so 08, 09, 2010, 2011, we were in New York. 2012, we decided we were going to go to the Palms Casino in Vegas. The timing was right. The brand had fully converted to Stupid Cancer. Uh, we, were, we were poised for greatness. And we said, how do we one-up ourselves with Vegas? And Matt and I were probably... At the diner drunk on bacon and we said well let's do a road trip so then of course it's like well who's going to do the road trip <laughs> there's definitely been moments over the past five and a half years or so when i've said to myself i didn't sign up for this and uh the road trip definitely was one of those things like all right i'll, I'll drive a new it car it sounds cool in a diner but once you're on the road it's probably not as uh glamorous right. so my my now great friend, one of my favorite people, John Sabia, and I, uh, he's done all our videos for us. He has his own company. Uh, we said, hey, John, what do you think about this idea to go cross country? And he's kind of one of those ride or die people. And he's like, all right, you know, I'm in. 
I mean, so we, we plotted the course. We got in touch with Volkswagen, and they gave us a 2012 Turbo Beetle uh, when the Beetle was brand new, when they had relaunched the body style. So it was well-timed. It was just, it was a great campaign. And the clincher for the road trip, which we had done meetups in different cities every night, uh, I think we, we were doing 10 days, uh, and now it's 14 days. But when we rolled into Vegas, day one of the conference, we're in the Pearl Theater, which is a huge theater, 2,500 seats. We pull the car out on stage for the opening ceremonies and get out of the car and welcome everybody. And people were just completely taken off guard, blown away. You know, here comes this car rolling out on stage at mm. this OMG summit, you know, cancer survivors. It was just, it was, it was magical. Yeah. It was, it was awesome. Um, so we, we did that. We did that two more times in Vegas and now it's in Denver and it's called CancerCon. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I noticed, um, obviously, you know, we're talking about e a lot of e-commerce, but there's a lot of integrated approaches because you have conferences, you have an app. Yeah. Um, and I know that you do some consulting uh, with nonprofits. So when yep. some, a company comes to you and says, all right, Kenny, I need to improve my e-commerce side of things that take pressure off, whether it's a conference or donations, where do you start? Yeah. That? So, so for us, I, I think even more so than revenue, it was um, – you know, I come from the pharmacy background. I worked in retail pharmacy for years. I just knew that there was an opportunity there. And then, you know, when we went from the five grand in revenue to 25 grand, we kind of took a step back and said, well, if we do this right, we could potentially offset some of the burden of fundraising, right. you know, asking people for five, ten, twenty five hundred dollars, you know, and they can get a t shirt out of it. So when people come to me who, um, you know, depending on what they, what their mission is, what their message is, um, you know, stupid cancer is an easy sell. It passes the t-shirt test. But if you are any given body part organization, you can come up with a clever slogan and sell it. You know, there's organizations that support testicular cancer that will have a shirt that says, love my nuts, or one for the girlfriend that says, I love his nuts. You know, there's ways to kind of circumvent, you know, actually printing the name of your organization right. and, and create something that's going to move. Right. Yeah, that's a good point because someone may say, well, like the scissors example, my business is not sexy or it just is not that emotional. What do right. I do? And you could come up with like a, just a motto or something to put on any product, you know, yeah. besides just T-shirts or whatever it is. Um, yeah, that's a good point. And so what have you seen or as far as obviously you want to keep growing the, the e-commerce, what is the next step? What do you think is, is going to help? Yeah. Well, all right. Everybody who's watching this has to sign a non-disclosure. <laughs> uh, so we, we also use the tagline called get busy living. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One of Matt's favorite movies is Shawshank Redemption. Yeah. Uh, you hear it, you hear it in, in media and in life and, uh, you know, our community is really identified with it, and um, you know, really attributed to us now almost as much as stupid cancer. So I recently registered the domain uh, getbusyliving.clothing, which points to uh, the Get Busy Living brand section of my big commerce store. And the goal there is to create a new line of products that will appeal to everyone. You know, kind of like a life is good. Or the flip side of that coin, which is life is shit, um, yeah. <laughs> which is another great brand. Uh, but trying to decancerify everything within the store, um, so that if you know if a friend is coming to buy a T-shirt for their cancer survivor in their life, you know maybe they'll pick up a get busy living yoga pant or something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, another way that I've also considered going with it is gifts for survivors. So, you know, we talk about things like creams or lifestyle products, mm -hmm. you know, def things that will just make the, the journey easier. I toyed around with the idea of doing a subscription where, you know, maybe it would be box one, box two, box three, or the August stupid cancer kit, 
where you get, you know, something that will brighten your day if you're sitting in chemo and somebody hands you this thing. Mm. Um, yeah. Because we certainly have the audience for it. Yeah. The hesitation and the, I guess, the consideration is cost of inventory, you know, cost of kitting the stuff out, warehousing it, and ultimately, you know, revenue versus the cost of goods sold. Um, yeah. You know, we, we, we try to fly between the clouds of the burden of purchasing all this stuff and profiting and being able to support the organization because ultimately we're paying for the conference, we're paying for the mobile app, we're paying to produce the radio show. So we need to be able to operate while we grow strategically. Mm-hmm. You know, we're not we're not taking out a business loan to invest three hundred thousand dollars in product because right. that would not be you know, we would not be good stewards of a nonprofit. Yeah. I mean, that kind of brings up too, um, you know, you bring up obviously physical goods. I want to tell, have you talk about what's the toughest part about running the e-commerce. But I do want to get to, you know, having inventory is also very costly. And obviously I see the trend. I think it's really pretty genius as far as the mobile app goes. So I want to talk about that. But, but first, what's the toughest part about running the e-commerce? Yeah, so, I mean, I mentioned them earlier. Uh, we, we migrated from Volusion to Big Commerce. Mm. Um, one of the, the issues that we had early on was the reporting functionality. And uh, our bookkeeper, who was used to doing our business a certain way, um, you know, had to adapt his practice to now record all these transactions. You know, thing, we had to file for sales tax. There was a lot of upfront uh, action items that we had to, to do, but we didn't necessarily know that we were going to have to do them. Um, so I mean, once we ironed out the internal process, things like recording inventory, um, going through our financial audit every year, now we have to account for things that are sitting on the shelf at the end of the year, whereas you know it was, it was bank balances previously. and. Yeah, it, we have to go through and figure Accounting out. Accounting wise, it's just a little right. bit more of a it, nightmare. It became a little wider. It became a little deeper. Um, figuring out cost of goods sold for every item, multiplying the inventory. There was a lot of granularity to it uh, that perhaps, from a pure profit perspective, up front it was it wasn't even break even. It was a lot of time invested to get the store up, yeah. but. You know, you reach a certain point where you do break even, and then, you know, you hope that the success will continue, and that's kind of where we're at now. Mm-hmm. And so, is that why big commerce you pre- you prefer it because of the reporting, or is there other things that yeah, you like so about it? I got a random sales call in the fall of 2013 uh, from a sales rep, and I was able to go through the product demo myself and ultimately migrate and change the DNS uh, within about 36 hours. Mm. It was really no time at all. Um, you know, it was, it was, it was really great to just switch. It was, it was everything I had hoped for, yeah. uh, that I didn't know that I needed. So what other systems software do you use? Yeah. So, so as I mentioned before, we, we have the warehouse and one of the obstacles now is losing touch with my inventory. So I used to do all the fulfillment, uh, staff members would help me, but yeah, if we sold a lot of red shirts, I would know that the red shirt was trending, whereas now I don't see that. Mm. You know, the, the, I mean, you do it yourself, like in an office. You'd be correct. So I, I'm, I'm looking at a radio studio desk. I would be folding T-shirts on the desk and packing and shipping with ShipStation and Indicia, and uh, literally filling up a bag for the post office and wheeling it down West Broadway to the Canal Street. Post office. Right. So you're talking about a very manual process. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we did a flash sale last summer that yielded about 350 orders. Wow. And Matt was like, "You're not filling orders anymore. Right. You need. Like, to, you, you're you going to stay up for two days straight." <laughs> <laughs> so I actually I came in on the Sunday and I started filling the orders and I was like, "Yeah, I think it's time." Um, but luckily, I had done an RFP for the warehouse and I recently wrote a blog post about it. Um, it was a matter of location, mm-hmm. automation, and accommodation. Mm-hmm. 
and obviously location. We're in the Northeast. It made sense to have our products in the Northeast. Um, we did. We do typically ship most to California, so that was a consideration of mm-hmm. you know, do we should we just have stuff out there? But for us, if we need product next day, USPS first class, it'll get here from Pennsylvania in a day. Um, the automation part of it was a lot of these uh, 3PLs were quoting me, all right, you know, we'll do a manual export of your orders, we'll send you back the tracking numbers in an Excel spreadsheet, and you can do your thing. And while you know, it sounded better than me filling the orders, I was still saying, all right, this is going to take a lot of time. Um, luckily, I found a warehouse that we, um, between their system and Big Commerce, we found a plugin called Dropstream that anytime an order is placed, it gets sent over, and then around 4.30, they do the, you know, the end of day closeout, and it sends all the tracking numbers back to Big Commerce, mm-hmm. and the customers get the email. Mm-hmm. And then the accommodation was really, you know, we get T-shirts in bulk, in boxes, they're not folded, they're not bagged, they're not barcoded, mm. and we needed a warehouse that was going to take them in and, you know, for 15 Get cents a shirt, yeah. right, for, for 15 cents a shirt, they are willing to fold them. Wow. Um, You're like, amen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Uh, I didn't know if we were going to have to have the shirts sent here. We would fold them and send them. Luckily, this warehouse, Carol, Carol Media, Carol Fulfillment in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, Hmm. They have been a, uh, a godsend. So, Carol Fulfillment, that's a good resource. Any ones that you found on the West Coast that if you were on the West Coast that you would consider? Yeah, I forget. So, originally I had been at the Etel West show in Palm Springs, which if you're unfamiliar, it's a giant uh, trade show hmm. for, for online sellers. And I was in the exhibit booth and I found a company called uh, Fifth Gear. And Fifth Gear is a mega warehouse. And upon me filling out a questionnaire, they said, all right, you're a little too small for our typical you know, engagement. But here's you know, 15 other ones. Mm. So they, they sent out my questionnaire to their network. Mm-hmm. And that's how we got in touch with a couple of the different ones um, around the country. Mm-hmm. So then what else? So you have the... Um, now you have the plugin that you know goes with Big Commerce that goes to Carol Fulfillment. What else other systems do you use? So to mitigate and remedy some of the not seeing the inventory issues, I use a service called Inventory Planner, mm-hmm. and it's inventory inventory dash planner dot com. And what that does is through API, it syncs up with your store, pulls in all your uh, SKUs, your product names, your images, your retail prices, your quantity on hand, and then it actually does demand forecasting, and it'll tell you uh, based on any variable what's in stock. Mm-hmm. So if I want to see if I want to see every product that is red, it'll tell me how many red products I want to see. Mm. If I want to see hoodies, if I want to see how many T-shirts, so that helps me see what's actually on the shelf. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the inventory software works for them. It's not quite, um, you know, what I enjoy using. So having something that kind of bridges the gap between just numbers and also context mm-hmm. is really important for me. Mm-hmm. And then you use Skubana. Not to make this a Skubana commercial, but I want to hear, you know, how do you use it? What works with that? Yeah. So we're actually onboarding with Skubana now, mm. um, and the team over there has uh, taken me through the product and I think that it will help me uh, even more so demystify some of the things related to having inventory offsite Um, because ultimately you know you lose the physical touch you lose the pack and pick Uh, it's it's not a detriment but it certainly impacts the way that you run your business and you know, I feel like there's certainly money being left on the table if I'm if I'm not seeing the trending stuff. Right. You're not um, actually shipping it and like have your hands on. Okay, I just I know that these red shirts I'm sending out like 15 of them. I should I should think about selling more. Right. I mean, obviously, with any new software system, it takes time. So you right. must have. What did you like about it? Why did you decide to actually implement it? Because you knew there's always like that onboarding process. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I, I mean, I'm the kind of person that tests and breaks and, you know, tests again. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm pretty confident that this will be able to help me uh, just operate the store more efficiently because ultimately I have a job to do. I'm, I'm running a cancer charity. I'm not running an online store. You know, right. I, I tell you know I tell my friends there are some days that are really cancery and then there are some days that are more you know business and you know, online selling. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm 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 very hopeful that Skibana will help us uh, continue down the path of success. Yeah. Anything else um, as far as software systems that have been really helpful? I used a, a platform called Lexity, mm -hmm. and what Lexity does. It was acquired by Yahoo when Marissa, Mar uh, Marissa Meyer took over and started buying up all these little startups. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it showed me in real time what people were shopping for. And I was using it on Volusion and then I used it when I moved over to Big Commerce. And uh, it really helped me with the 301 redirect process. Uh, it wasn't something that I did on the front end because I was just trying to get the new store up. So. I think I mentioned that I was in the car when I was going through the big commerce migration period, recreating the store, and I was on the way to a three-day conference. So what I did is I sat at the conference with my laptop open, looking at Lexity, and I can see when people were hitting page not found. Mm. And part of the Volusion migration to big commerce was I took a bunch of old items out that I knew just weren't going to be coming back. So if somebody hit a page not found for an item I discontinued, I would try to figure out where the best place to send them was. All right, so maybe I'll send them to this new T-shirt or this other wristband. Um, so that was a really, really good process to go through. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, Kenny, what else as far as resources that you think are good that people should check out for e-commerce or companies that you follow as thought leadership goes? Yeah, I'd be remiss not to mention a private community called e-commerce fuel. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of, I'll say, mid-tier merchants who are, you know, maybe doing five hundred thousand to a couple of million, and those are the people who are um, just bootstrapped and and really trying to hustle, and they're sharing, you know, real life problems and coming up with real life solutions uh, for platforms in general and just online selling in in general as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I read a lot of industry blogs, so practical e-commerce. I read the big commerce blog. I read Shopify blog. Um, it, it's really easy to, to just drown yourself in content. Right. So when thing, things typically will jump out, um, yeah, if you're facing a particular issue. Yeah. So, Kenny, I, w I have one last question before I ask it. Where can people find out more? What sites should they check out? Sure. So, if you're looking for cancer support in the 20s and 30s area, uh, definitely check out stupidcancer.org. If you are looking to support someone in their 20s and 30s, you can buy a t-shirt at stupidcancerstore.org, and that will help uh, keep us going and make us possible. Uh, if you are on a self-hosted platform and you are trying to figure out your next step, check out Big Commerce. Uh, and, and then you have a couple of conferences yeah. on Instapeer. Yeah, so definitely come uh, to any of our conferences. We have CancerCon. We have uh, coastal conferences. So we have OMG West and OMG East. Uh, OMG West is new for us this year, so we're happily expanding our product offering. Yeah. Um, we have local meetups around the country. We have this road trip that somehow continues to roll through the. <laughs> so it's not <laughs> over yet. No. Well, we've done we've done four of them so far. Uh, next April is planned to be number five, and we may. You say it with such may, enthusiasm. No. <laughs> yeah. Once you get there, I'm sure it's rewarding, you know? Oh, no, yeah. Yeah. and, and I, I have no reason to complain. I mean, I've been to, I think, 39 of the 50 states, and I've made connections with people. I've, you know, held hands in prayer when people were, um, you know, facing dire circumstances. I have 
celebrated and you know cheers to people getting into remission mm. it's miracles and tragedies every single day yeah. and um the road trip is the one time of the year when personally i'm able to see the impact of what stupid cancer does and you know connect with the strength of the people in this community which is you know it's second to none mm -hmm. you, you 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 walk in disney world and you feel something, you know, whether it's your inner child kind of coming back to life. When you walk into our conference, you feel a certain energy of, um, you warmth. know, people, warmth and people not worrying about, you know, the little things in life. You know, it, it's, it's just magic. Uh, there's really no other way to put it. So the fact that we are probably going to have a tour bus next year instead of a car, uh, you're it's upgrading. Exciting. It's exciting, but at the same time, I'm wondering if I have to go to get my CDL now. <laughs> um, so, last question, Kenny. People should, you know, obviously check out the site. You know, the site stupidcancer.org. Um, you know, since it's the Scubani e-commerce mastery series, my question is: We talked a lot about different e-commerce solutions and things. What best actionable tips should we leave people right now to increase their e-commerce business? Yeah. I would say try to find, if, you, if you're looking to grow, and this is what I did, um, find the intersection of minimum orders and profit. Uh, what I mean by that is if it costs $10 a t-shirt for 47 of them, but if you order 48, they go down to $5, order the 48th one, but don't necessarily order you know, up to the next jump without making the next jump. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've certainly tested and tried things that have flopped. Mm -hmm. And there are times when I've you know, been very grateful that I didn't say, hey, this is the order when I'm going to order, you know, I'm going to order so that the shirts are priced at $3. Right. Which might translate to, you know, tons of shirts. Um, so definitely find those minimums. Uh, time is money, so don't spend time on anything that could be done better through an automated process, whether it's something like using a ship station versus logging into a platform directly, especially if you're selling on Omnichannel. If you can have all your information go into one place so that you're not having all these different tabs open, it's really efficiency and it's low cost. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if you do something long enough, you'll look back and You'll you'll see a, a successful trend, and you just have to be patient. Mm -hmm. So, as far as the e-commerce journey so far, what has been one of your proudest moments? One of the proudest moments. Uh, it was definitely in the early days, and there's been subsequent ones. Um, but I remember seeing people posting pictures on Instagram and feeling great. Uh, I had a slide of Instagram shots that I just pulled down in one of my talks that I gave recently. And y you look at the people's expressions and, you know, whether they have the shirt on and they're just like pointing to stupid cancer, it really gives people permission to reclaim some of their uh, current situation. And, and our brand promise on some level is permission to be pissed permission to own your cancer diagnosis. So if, if I see people wearing a shirt that I had a hand in helping to get to them, it's just awesome. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people are jealous of them that they have it and they want them. And it's just, it's just great to be a part of it and helping yeah. drive the whole, whole movement. Yeah. And then you have won non-profiteer of the year? I did in 2013. What is, what is that exactly? So there's a group called the YNPN, the Young Nonprofit Professionals Network. Mm. Uh, we have a New York City chapter. So there was an open call for nominations of people doing uh, cool or interesting or unique things. Yeah. And I happened to be nominated, and then uh, they decided that I was the worthy victor. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, so I've since met some of the other nonprofit tier of the years, and you know, we're, we're all a little crazy for being in the charity world, but... Um, everybody is super motivated, super driven. Yeah. And uh, I actually sit on the board now of 
YNP and NYC. So cool. it's fun to, yeah, it's fun to have a hand in that as well and meet people uh, in different verticals within our nonprofit space. Yeah. Well, Kenny, thank you so much. It's been hugely valuable, and I want to be the first one to thank you for all your e-commerce knowledge and also for everything you do uh, at Stupid Cancer for everyone. So thank, thank you. Thank you so much. It's a blast. Yeah. Thanks, Kenny. See ya.